Hello, and welcome to General Astronomy, Lecture 19, Learning from Light. Matter leaves its fingerprints wherever it interacts with light. Examining the color of an object is a crude way of understanding the clues that are left behind um, from the matter that it contains. For example, a red shirt absorbs all visible photons except those in the red part of the spectrum. So we know that it must contain a dye with these special light absorbing characteristics. If we take light and disperse it into a spectrum, we can see the spectral fingerprints more clearly. The image here on the right shows the sun's visible light spectrum in great detail, with the rainbow of color stretching in horizontal rows from the upper left to the lower right of the photograph. We see similar dark or bright lines when we look at almost any spectrum whether it is the spectrum of the flame from a gas grill in somebody's backyard, or the spectrum of a distant galaxy whose light we collect with a gigantic telescope. As long as we collect enough light to see details in the spectrum, we can learn many fundamental properties of the object we are viewing, no matter how far away the object is located. The process of obtaining a spectrum and reading the information it contains is called spectroscopy. If you project a spectrum produced by a prism onto a wall, it will look like a rainbow, at least for visible light. However, it's often more useful to display spectra as graphs that show the amount or intensity of the light at each wavelength. So although it's nice to look at this rainbow image here, it doesn't tell us as much information as we might be able to get. So instead, we're going to take this and put it into a graph, an X and Y graph. So let's take a look at how this works. So we're talking about the spectrum of light coming from an object. Well, laboratory studies show that spectra come in three basic types. The first is that spectrum of a traditional or incandescent light bulb, which contains a heated wire filament. Um, it gives a rainbow of color because uh, a rainbow spans a broad range of wavelengths without interruption. We call it a continuous spectrum. So if you just take a, a standard light bulb, pass that light through a prism, well, you've seen this before, I'm sure, you get a rainbow of color. So the intensity is pretty much just a nice flat curve. So you have some amount or intensity of light at all of the wavelengths. You get the full rainbow. So because it's a full rainbow without any interruption, it's called a continuous spectrum. The second type is when you have a thin or low density cloud of gas that emits light only at specific wavelengths. That depends on its composition and temperature. The spectrum therefore consists of bright emission lines against a black background and therefore is called an emission line spectra. So if you have a gas that's giving off its own light at some specific wavelength and then you take that and pass it through a prism, you'll see only specific bands of color, not the full rainbow anymore, just whatever light is being given off by this gas. So when you look at the intensity or the amount of light at each wavelength, you'll see nothing for a lot of it, and then sudden jumps or peaks in its intensity because you're getting more light at that color. So as a result, this is called an emission line spectrum because the cloud of gas is emitting light at a certain wavelength. So the third and final type is the absorption line spectrum. If the cloud of gas lies between us and a light bulb, we still see most of the continuous spectrum of the light bulb. However, the cloud will absorb light of specific wavelengths, so the spectrum will show dark bands of lines over the background rainbow, making it what we call an absorption line spectrum. Note that when the spectra are shown as graphs, absorption lines appear as dips on a background of relatively high intensity light, while emission lines look like spikes on a background with little or no intensity. So here we can see what happens in this situation. So you take the standard light bulb like we saw a moment ago, let me go back, and you got a full rainbow and a nice constant graph here uh, of intensity. But now we're putting a little cloud of gas in between the prism and the light source. So this gas is going to absorb some of that light, and then we're going to see that full rainbow, but with little pieces of it missing because some of that was absorbed. So our intensity drops off at these little regions. And this is kind of uh, like how our atmosphere can scatter some light. We have some gas in our atmosphere that, in this case, is scattering light, so we don't see everything. But the point is, um, there are three scenarios in which we will get some type of spectrum. Continuous, if you just have a light source giving off light directly toward us. 
um, in emission line spectrum if you have a cloud of gas giving off a certain light, and here we see the absorption line spectrum if you have something blocking some of the light from behind. Well, let's return to the sun spectrum for a second. We can apply these ideas to the solar spectrum, which shows numerous absorption lines over a background of rainbow color. This tells us that we are essentially looking at a hot light source through gas that is absorbing some of the colors, right? So here's our full rainbow, but little pieces are missing. So something is in between uh, the sun where the light comes from and us looking at it. For the solar spectrum, the hot light source is the hot interior of the sun, while the cloud of gas that we were talking about is the relatively cool and low density layers of gas at the top of the sun's visible surface, which we call the photosphere. We'll learn a lot about the sun a couple lectures from now. So this just gives you an idea. So suddenly we now know a little bit about the sun just because of this image. We know it's giving off light at a full spectrum, but we know there's some, some gases in the upper atmosphere absorbing some of its light. So already we know that much about the sun just because of this image and studying its light. Chemists discovered that they could produce spectral lines in the laboratory and use these spectral lines to analyze what kind of atoms different substances are made of. Chemists had long known that many substances emit distinctive colors when sprinkled into a flame. To facilitate studies of these colors, around 1857, the German chemist Robert Bunsen invented a gas burner, which is called the Bunsen burner today. You've probably used one in high school or uh, some chemistry classes in college. That produces a clean flame with no color of its own. So you can see that here on the right. So what they would do is they would take a Bunsen burner and then sprinkle substances on it, and it would change color. So you can figure out what the substance is made of because of those color changes. So let's go into this a little bit further. Bunsen's colleague, the Prussian-born physicist Gustav Kirchhoff, suggested that the colored light produced when substances were added to the flame might best be studied by passing the resulting light through a prism. The two scientists promptly discovered that the spectrum from the flame consists a pattern of thin, bright spectral lines against a dark background. In other words, you should now know that that would be an emission line spectrum. Kirchhoff and Bunsen then found that each chemical element produces its own unique pattern of spectral lines. Thus was born in 1859 the technique of spectral analysis, which is the identification of atoms and molecules just by the unique patterns of spectral lines. You can, e you can easily see that each substance produces a unique pattern of spectral lines. Each pattern can be thought of as a spectral fingerprint for identification. This is enormously important in astronomy because it allows us de to determine the detailed compositions of distant planets and stars. These photographs here on the right show the spectra of different types of gases as measured in a laboratory here on Earth. Each type of gas has a unique spectrum that is the same wherever in the universe the gas is found. So if you look at this, each element here has its own unique spectrum. That's why we call it a fingerprint. So if you were to have some random like, bottle of gas, let's just say, and you, pat, pour, you take, take it and you pass light through it, and you see these different bands of light. Say you don't know what the element is, but you know there's just some gas in there. Well, you can look at the light and then compare it to these and figure out what it is. Um, now, if this was a face-to-face -face class, um, I would be able to show you this. We actually have little um, tubes of gas that we... Um, run an electric current through to heat them up and give off light. And we can actually compare them to these different um, spectras here. So you can actually see this firsthand, and it's a really neat demonstration. Um, but it's a really cool thing here, I mean, and especially in astronomy, because everything we see from a star is light. So if we can take that light and figure out what these little bands look like, we can suddenly figure out what those objects are made out of. And that's a big deal, at least at the surface. All right. We have seen how emission and absorption line spectra f uh, form and how, we s uh, and how we can use them to determine the composition of a cloud or gas. Now we are ready to turn our attention to continuous spectra. Although continuous spectra can be produced in more than one way, that is light bulbs, planets, and stars, uh, they all produce kinds of continuous spectrum that can help us determine their temperatures. 
So not only can we figure out their, spec their chemical uh, composition, like we just discussed, we can also figure out their temperatures. In a cloud of gas that produces a simple emission or absorption line spectrum, the individual atoms or molecules are essentially independent of one another. Most photons pass easily through such a gas. However, the atoms and molecules within most of the objects we encounter in everyday life, such as rocks, light bulb filaments, and people, cannot be considered independent. These objects tend to absorb light across a broad range of wavelengths, which means that light cannot easily pass through them, right? We don't see light passing through our human bodies very easily. Um, so you can't easily see light pass through them, and light emitted inside them cannot escape easily. The same is true of almost any large or dense object, including planets and stars. In order to understand the spectra of such objects, let's consider an idealized case in which an object absorbs all photons that strike it and does not allow photons inside it to escape easily. Photons tend to bounce randomly around on the insides of such an object, constantly exchanging their energy with its atoms and molecules. By the time the photons finally escape the object, their radiative energies have become randomized so that they are spread over a wide range of wavelengths. The wide range uh, of wavelength of the photons explains why the spectrum of light from such an object is smooth or continuous like a pure rainbow without any absorption or emission lines. Most important, the spectrum from such an object depends on only one thing, the object's temperature. To understand why, remember that temperature represents the average energy of the atoms or molecules in an object. Because the randomly bouncing photons of light interact so many times with those atoms and molecules, they end up with energies that match the energy of the object's atoms or molecules, which means that photon energies depend only on the object's temperature regardless of what the object is made of. The temperature dependence of this light explains what we call explains why we call it thermal radiation, or what we call blackbody radiation, and why its spectrum is called a blackbody radiation spectrum. Any object that absorbs all radiation falling upon it is known as a blackbody. No real object emits a perfect blackbody spectrum, but almost all familiar objects, including the sun, the planets, rocks, and even you, emit light that approximates blackbody radiation. The figure here on the right shows graphs of the idealized blackbody radiation spectra of three stars and a human, each with its temperature given in the Kelvin scale. Be sure to notice that these spectra show the intensity of light per unit surface area, not the total amount of light emitted by the objects. For example, a very large 3000 degree Kelvin star given by the red line or curve can emit more total light than a small 1500 degree Kelvin star, even though the hotter star emits much more light per unit area. So these just show you, again, uh, a blackbody curve. It's a, a, a continuous spectrum, um, and it shows you, for, for example, um, the hottest star here is giving off more intensity on, at all wavelengths. And then as you get to cooler and cooler objects, they're not giving off as much energy. So you can see that a human doesn't give off anywhere near as much as a 1500 degree Kelvin star. So these curves, whenever you see a curve like this, is what we call a black body spectrum. And you get you have a black body whenever it's an object that absorbs all radiation falling upon it. Spectra obey two laws of black body radiation, and these are very important. Law one, the Stefan Boltzmann law. Each square meter of a hotter object's surface emits more light at all wavelengths. For example, each square meter of the surface of a 1500 degree star emits a lot more light at every single wavelength than each square meter of the 3000 degree Kelvin star. And the hotter star emits light at some ultraviolet wavelengths that the cooler star does not emit at all. So the Stefan Boltzmann law just says that it's emitting more energy at all wavelengths, right? It's more light at all wavelengths compared to this red one, right? The blue is higher than the red at all points. But it also says that this can give off ultraviolet light, whereas this red star doesn't give off any red light, or any ultraviolet light. So it's very important. Um, so this equation here relates these two things. This is the, um, the energy given off, the flux, 
is equal to some constant, it's just a number, times the temperature raised to the fourth power. So the intensity of light that you get uh, only depends on temperature. This is just a number, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so it's a very important concept. The second law is Wien's law. Hotter objects emit photons with a higher average energy, which means a shorter average wavelength. That is why the peak of the spectra, called the wavelength of maximum emission, so here's the wavelength of maximum emission, the peak here, peak here, and so on. They are shorter at um, wavelengths for hotter objects. So as you increase in temperature, notice that the peak is moving further to the left, where it is more energetic. So hotter objects see their peak at smaller wavelengths, right? We're getting smaller as we go to the left. So the hotter you get, the smaller the wavelength gets. That means it's more energetic. For example, the peak of the 1500 degree Kelvin star is in the ultraviolet light, but the peak of the 5800 degree sun is in visible light, and the peak for the 3000 degree star is in the infrared. So this can be uh, modeled mathematically. It depends again only on temperature, but that that wavelength of maximum emission, or the peak, is equal to this number divided by the temperature of your object. That's it. So temperature plays a huge role here. So just become slightly familiar with these equations, at least a little bit. You won't have to use them very much, if at all. You might use this bottom one more. Um, but just know that this is where it's coming from, basically just showing how important temperature is on these things. So again, you have more intensity with temperature, right? So the hotter your star, the more intensity of light and the hotter your star, the smaller the wavelength. So it decreases. Because thermal radiation spectra depend only on temperature, we can use them to measure the temperatures of distant objects. In many cases, we can estimate temperatures simply from the object's color. Notice that uh, while hotter objects emit more light at all wavelengths, the biggest difference appears at the shorter wavelengths. At human body temperatures of about 310 degrees Kelvin, people emit mostly in the infrared and emit no visible light at all, which explains why we don't glow in the dark, unless you're an alien or something. A relatively cool star with a 3000 degree Kelvin surface temperature emits mostly red light. That is why some bright stars in our sky, such as Betelgeuse in the Orion Nebula and Antares in Scorpius, appear reddish in color. The sun's 5,800 degree Kelvin surface emits mostly in green light around 500 nanometers, but the sun looks yellow or white to our eyes because it also emits other colors through the visible spectrum. Hotter stars emit mostly in the ultraviolet but appear bluish white in color because our eyes cannot see their ultraviolet light. If an object were heated to a temperature of millions of degrees, it would radiate mostly in x-rays. Some astronomical objects are indeed hot enough to emit x-rays, such as disks of gas encircling exotic objects like neutron stars and black holes, something we'll talk about far in the future of our course. Hotter stars emit... Um, oh, no, I said that already, excuse me. So um, this is really important. So now we can see that there is a connection between temperature and color. So people radiate in, in uh, infrared light, so we don't see it. A cool star may emit in the red, the hottest stars emit in blue and white. So this is just an example here showing a fire poker. If you heat this up, it, originally on its own without being heated, it's just black. But as you heat it up, it begins to glow and it gets brighter as you glow. I, I'm sorry, it gets brighter as you go and it changes color from red to white. So this shows both of those two laws that we talked about. It's getting brighter because of our Stefan Boltzmann law, right? It, get, um, it emits more light with a hotter object. So it's getting brighter because of that. And then the second law, it's changing from red to white because its wavelength is decreasing as you go. So it's going from red to yellow to bluish to white. So very important connections to make. And this is just another example of this. Um, so here we have an example just showing uh, heating up a piece of glass. Again, uh, the hotter it gets, the more it goes from red to bluish white. So it's going from red to orange to yellow. And you can see this compared to stars. Here's a star that's red, an orange star, and a yellow star. 
So just because of these colors, we can tell that this star is the hottest, this is the middle in temperature, and this red star is the coolest. So just by looking at color, we can figure out temperatures. This figure here on the right shows the black body curve for a temperature of 5,800 degrees Kelvin, as well as the intensity curve for light from the sun. So this dashed line is what it would look like if it's a perfect black body where it doesn't absorb any radiation for 5,800 degrees Kelvin. And then this squiggly line is the actual one that we see for the sun. And notice that they look very similar other than some of the squiggles. Well, the peak of both curves is at a wavelength of about 500 nanometers, near the middle of the visible spectrum. Note how closely the observed intensity curve for the sun matches the blackbody curve. This is a strong indication that the temperature of the sun's glowing surface is roughly 5,800 degrees Kelvin, a temperature that we can measure across a distance of 150 kilometers here on Earth. So the spectrum of the sun very closely matches the spectrum of something that is 5,800 degrees Kelvin. So we know just from this that the sun's temperature at the surface is 5,800 degrees Kelvin. It's that simple. We just look at the light, put it onto a graph, and we pretty much almost instantly can figure out the temperature of that object. It's really quite amazing. And then based on these little dips and bumps, the emission or absorption, you can figure out what the sun's made out of at the surface as well. So these are very powerful tools in astronomy. Blackbody radiation depends only on the temperature of the object emitting the radiation, not on the chemical composition. The light emitted by molten gold at 2000 degrees Kelvin is very nearly the same as the emitted light by molten lead at 2000 degrees as well. Therefore, it might seem that analyzing the light from the sun or from a star can tell astronomers the object's temperature, but not what the star is made of. The intensity curve for the sun, which is a pretty typical star, is not precisely that of a black body. The differences between a star's spectrum and that of a black body allow us to determine that chemical composition of the star. So the peak of each can help us determine the temperature, and then the differences because of these dips or bumps, that is again emission or absorption, the differences of those from the curve tell us what the object is made out of. We can learn about the motion of objects uh, relative to us uh, from changes in their spectrum caused by what we call the Doppler effect. Now, um, again, I have a video here for you, so if you're watching this video, it's a good point to stop this video and go to the YouTube description uh, where I will have a link to this video, and I highly recommend you watching it real quick. If I recall, it's just a car that drives by, and you can hear this Doppler effect. You might want to watch it at the end of this slide, um, but at any point in this slide, I would recommend going over to that and watching it. So. Um, you've probably noticed the Doppler effect on the sound of a train whistle near train tracks. If the train is stationary, the pitch of the whistle sounds the same no matter where you stand. But if the train is moving, the pitch sounds higher when the train is coming toward you and lower when it's moving away from you. Just as the train passes by, you can hear the dramatic change from a high to low pitch. To understand, we have to think about what happens to the sound waves coming from the train. When the train is moving toward you, each pulse of a sound wave is emitted a little bit closer to you. So here's an example of this. So say you're in front of the train, not on the tracks, hopefully, but the train's coming toward you. Well, every single time it releases a, a sound wave, each sound wave is getting closer and closer to you. Um, so the result is that waves are bunched up between you and the train, giving them a shorter wavelength and therefore a higher frequency or pitch. So as it's coming toward you, the waves are really close together, so the wavelength, the up and down motions, are really small, which means the frequency is high, and you get a really high pitch, so it sounds like a higher sound. But as you are saying, let's say the train is now passed by you. As it passes by you, each pulse comes from farther and farther away, stretching out the wavelength and giving the sound a lower frequency and a lower pitch. So that's why you hear this Doppler effect with the sound of that or a car horn as it goes by will change its pitch. Well, the Doppler effect causes similar shifts in wavelengths of light in an, um, of light, excuse me. If an object is moving toward us, the light waves bunch up between us and the object, so its entire spectrum is shifted to shorter wavelengths. Because shorter wavelengths of visible light are bluer, the Doppler shift of an oncoming 
I'm sorry, the Doppler shift of an object coming toward us is called a blue shift. So now instead of sound, we just use light. So say maybe a star is moving toward us a little bit. Well, it's going to bunch up those little light waves, so it's got a higher frequency, and therefore it will be a little bit bluer. It has more energy, and it shifts it to the blue. And the opposite is true if it's moving away from us. Uh, its light will be shifted to longer wavelengths then, so we call this Doppler shift a redshift because we know that longer wavelengths of light are redder in color. Spectral lines provide uh, the reference points we use to identify and measure Doppler shifts. For example, suppose we recognize a pattern of hydrogen lines in the spectrum of a, different, of a distant object. We know the, the rest wavelengths of the hydrogen lines, that is, their wavelengths if it was stationary, um, from laboratory experiments in which a tube of hydrogen gas is heated so that its wavelength of the spectral lines can be measured. So let's just say that's what we have here. Here is that example. Well, if the hydrogen lines from the object appear at longer wavelengths, then we know they are redshifted. Um, excuse me, I lost my place. Then we know that they are redshifted and the object is moving away from us. So lines are redshifted here, so maybe it's an object moving away from us. If we get this pattern here, but we know this blue line should be to the left a little bit, the yellow should be to the left a little bit, a little bit and the red to the left a little bit, well, it's shifted. We know this now. So just because it was shifted toward the red, well, now we suddenly know that this object is moving away from us. So that's a really important tool. Um, so the opposite can be true as well. So suppose we look at spectral lines of a planet or star that happens to be rotating. As the object rotates, light from the parts of the object rotating, to rotating toward us will be blue shifted, whereas light from the part rotating away from us will be red shifted, and light from the center of the object won't be shifted at all. The net effect, if we look at the whole object at once, is to make each spectral line appear wider than it would be if the object were not rotating. The faster the object is rotating, the broader in wavelength the spectral lines become. So if we have a rotating object, we will see thicker lines. We can therefore determine the rotation rate of distant objects as well by measuring the width of its lines. So this is amazing. So, I mean, we can figure out not only composition and temperature of an object just by its light, but now we can see if it's moving away from us or toward us because it'll be either red shifted or blue shifted. And we can also figure out if it's rotating and how fast it's rotating because the lines will get thicker if it's rotating. So it's just an incredible amount of tools that we can use just by looking at light. So light is a cosmic messenger. It tells us everything, well, maybe not everything, but it tells us a lot about the universe. So I leave you now with this image. Um, this is not an actual test, but I'll test you a little bit here. So this is a spectrum of an object. I won't tell you what it is yet, but we'll get into that. There's a lot of different things going on here. Um, so if this was a test, I'd ask you, what is this right here? So I'm circling this. So what are you seeing here? So what you're seeing here are some dips in the spectrum. So that probably tells you there's some absorption going on here. Over here, we see some peaks. This should tell you that there's some emission at these wavelengths. Um, so you can also see this as extra color in the bands over here and some darkness in the bands over here. So anyway, let's get into this a little bit. First of all, you'll notice that there is relatively little blue light and a lot of red light. All right, so here's blue. There's not much of it, but there's a lot of red. So what does this tell us? The visible light we see from Mars, which is what this is a spectrum from, is actually reflected sunlight. Mars absorbs most of the blue light, but it reflects and scatters most of its red light. This is why Mars is red. Here we see thermal radiation peaks. So there's some peak here in the thermal, or in the infrared, right? So we have a big peak over here in infrared. This is thermal radiation. This is telling us that the objects emit a continuous spectrum of thermal radiation that peaks at this wavelength so we can figure out its temperature just by its peak. The peak indicates a surface temperature of 225 degrees Kelvin. So just by looking at this so far, we know the object is mostly red, and because it's Mars, we know that to be true. And just because of this peak here in the infrared, we know that its surface temperature is about 225 degrees Kelvin. Next, we see these emission lines in, ultraviolet, in the ultraviolet region, right, these peaks. What does this tell us? Well, this tells us that the thin atmosphere of Mars contains a hot gas at high altitudes. 
right? So remember that emission lines come from a hot gas giving off its own light. So there's gases in the atmosphere of Mars, even though it's a thin atmosphere, that are giving off its own ultraviolet light. So that's what we're seeing here. Next we see these absorption lines. These reveal the presence of carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere. So they are absorption lines at a very specific wavelength, and we can compare that to what the curve would look like without carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we'll see that those dips wouldn't be there. So we know, based on where these dips are, that this is a showing the presence of carbon dioxide. Last one. Um, this one's kind of hard to see, but the wavelengths uh, of the spectral lines are slightly shifted. They are shifted by an amount that depends on the velocity of Mars toward or away from us as it moves. So just by looking at this spectrum of light, so a second ago there was no information at all. Just by looking at this one graph that's seemingly random, we know the color of the object, we know um, the temperature at the surface of this object, we know there is an atmosphere with some hot gases in it. We know that there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because of these absorption lines. And we can figure out its speed relative to us because of these lines being moved back and forth due to the redshift or blue shift of the object. So again, light tells us a lot. And it does go into far more detail than this as you can probably imagine, but this is the basics of everything you might need to know for now. So what we're going to do now is start to move into topics of our sun. So we're going to talk about our sun next, now that we have a little bit of information about light. And then from there, we're going to talk about the nature of all stars. Um, that is, all stars in the universe, not like all star actors or anything. Um, so we learned from light. Now we're going to apply light to the sun and then apply what we know about light and the sun to all stars in the universe. So that's the next several lectures from now. I look forward to talking to you some more. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Take care and have a good day.